I thought tonight I might talk about risk, overall risk, because we are in a risky world, and then a bit about the military. And uh, I, I know your president, Lord Roe Meadow, knows that I've banged on about this continually in the House of Lords. I go on and on. I think they get fed up about it, especially when I talk about numbers of ships. They get a little bit carried away. Um, because I think our military, and the Navy in particular, have been dangerously weakened by a succession uh, of governments. Because, and at the moment, all eyes are on Brexit. Um, our nation, I think, and our government have lost sight of the growing threats to our security. And in the worst case, they actually could be our nation's very existence. So what does the world look like on the 12th of March 2018? Well, what a dangerous world it is. It's more unstable and chaotic than I've known in my entire 53 years on the active list in the Royal Navy. The great joy of having been a first sea lord is you stay on the active list forever. Um, so I've been in 53 years now. Russia, a superpower in nuclear terms, uh, is massively in investing in military capability, yet it's got a financial clout of Italy. That's its GDP, is Italy. Its economy is on a war footing. When you're chief of defense intelligence, one of the things you're always looking for is any country that might be doing that, because it is very, very high risk, because something has to give. You can't go on like that year after year after year after year. And if we look at their actions in Crimea, Ukraine, although I think we dealt with Crimea badly, I'm happy to take questions about that later. Now threats to the Baltic states, cyber attacks against NATO, um, the aggressive intrusion into NATO airspace, you know, near misses going on. Russian nuclear submarines actually actively hunting for our ballistic missile submarines. They've never found one, but they're hunting for them. Uh, the interference in U.S. and other countries' elections. Um, Putin's boasted about his new nuclear arsenal. He did it the other day with maps of how they were going to hit America. Um, the issue of attacks on Russians in the U.K. Uh, and it's quite clear now we know what the, what the uh, chemical was, that these came from one of two... Uh, laboratories in Russia. No one else makes them, and they were meant to have destroyed all those stocks. That was the agreement that all our countries had to destroy them. Um, so I think what uh, Theresa May has asked in terms of what they've got to come up and tell us is absolutely right. Again, I'm happy to take some questions later on that. Putin himself is a revisionist. He's an ex-KGB man. He hasn't changed. He believes in spheres of influence. He felt that Russia had had its face pushed in the mud post the collapse of the Soviet Union. He understands hard power. He talks loosely of use of nuclear weapons. It's extremely dangerous. Uh, and I think we have to be very, very robust. Uh, and we've got to use every channel to let him know how appalling his behavior is and how it's not acceptable in, in the world in which we live. There's instability in the Middle East. It's very difficult to identify a country um, that is not in turmoil. You know, where will that all end? And I could go on about that for a long time. The threat of terrorism has grown as a result of the turmoil. Um, and no country seems immune, actually, from terrorism. I was actually in New Zealand the other day. It's the only country I've been to that actually had a low threat of terrorism. And even there, they were the ones who produced the pamphlets that the people who hit the buildings on 9-11 were trained on, amazingly. So even there, there's the odd link going on. Um, the threat level in the UK is severe. That means an attack is highly likely. I keep telling people, it's wonderful. You know, that means, you know, imagine if you went to your heart surgeon, and he said, it's highly likely you'll have a heart attack tomorrow. You'd be quite interested, wouldn't you? You would be quite interested in that. And yet, British are so phlegmatic. I, I had a great friend, a chap called uh, Henry Allingham. He died a couple of years ago. He was 113. He'd been at Jutland in the First World War. He was a marvellous man. Um, and he told me a lovely story in the Blitz in Portsmouth. He was digging through the rubble with a mate, and they'd been doing this for three days. And he said, we got to this place, and there were a couple of legs, and we pulled this woman out. You know, she was a goner, and my mate opened this cabinet and pulled out, and there was a bottle of brandy. And he pulled the cork, he said, do, do you think we ought to have a slug of this? And I said, yeah, yeah, absolutely. He pulled the cork out, and this woman sat up and said, don't touch that, I'm saving it for an emergency. <laughs> and I thought, I thought, you know, this is the British, this is the British spirit, isn't it? This is the British spirit. Um, Afghanistan, I move on, still at risk of collapse. Stability in nuclear armed Pakistan. Great cause for concern. If Pakistan goes wrong, Afghanistan will seem like nothing. I mean, a real worry. In Korea, lots going on at the moment. You know, Kim Jong-un, the American position always was they would never accept North Korea having a functioning intercontinental ballistic missile with a thermonuclear warhead. They had four op plans to fight them if that happened. Now, because they've advanced so suddenly, they're in a difficult position. We've got the Winter Olympic love in. We're about to have a meeting, apparently, between Trump and Kim Jong-un, extraordinary, extraordinary. It's very high stakes. I still do not believe the Americans, if that goes wrong, will allow him 
to finally develop that. I just don't think they will. And there are still op plans on the table, not nuclear ones, I'm glad to say, but who knows what will happen because they've got about 28 atomic warheads. They produce their first thermonuclear warhead. Very worrying.